Yeah, I am Shivakumar. Uh, I am sitting in front of uh, Professor uh, P. Manohar, uh, MDDM cardiologist, Professor in uh, Sri Ramachandra uh, University, Chennai. Uh, today, in the interest of Indian uh, public, I am asking few questions which, is, which are all for the benefit of for all of us. Uh, Doctor, good evening. Good evening. Uh, sir, my first question is, uh, what is special about Indians and dyslipidemia? Uh, Indians and dyslipidemia is a, like you know a very uh, a very interesting uh, combination in that sense that uh, we are the highest risk population in terms of uh, coronary artery disease in the world. By that standards, we should have the highest dyslipidemia in the world as compared to the rest of the world. But it's not so. Why? Because in worldly terms, when we talk about dyslipidemia, usually it is people have very high bad cholesterol. But Indian dyslipidemic are special because we have a funny combination where we have normal or below normal bad cholesterol and very low or you know uh, drastically low good cholesterol and very high triglycerides. So this is a uh, you know a potent atherogenic triad that we are seeing in India. That is Indian dyslipidemic is typically a guy who has low HDL, near normal LDL and very high triglycerides. So, all the trials and all the uh, all the drugs which have always targeted bad cholesterol have to be reviewed in the Indian context because of the special nature of the Indian dyslipidemia, and that is the reason Indian dyslipidemia needs a rethink, re-understanding of the strategies that we use to treat Indian dyslipidemia. So, whenever an Indian patient comes across when we treat his dyslipidemia, we should have an Indian-centric approach rather than you know copy Western guidelines and in treating these patients. Well, doctor, uh, if my cholesterol is normal, should I take cholesterol drugs? Oh, this is a question 90% of my patients regularly ask me. I always tell them to take a tablet or not take a tablet is not dependent on your cholesterol levels, but on your background cardiovascular risk. If I have had a heart attack in the last year, then probably I should be on very high levels of cholesterol lowering medicines even if my cholesterol levels are normal or even less than normal. So the indication to treat cholesterol is not based on your cholesterol level but on your background cardiovascular risk. The importance of cholesterol level is not in terms of whether to take the tablet or not. It is more to decide the dosing of the treatment. So beyond the period of you know acute cholesterol lower, acute coronary syndrome where we give cholesterol lowering medication in high doses, beyond that checking for cholesterol may help us guide in the the you know dosing of the cholesterol lowering medicine. But otherwise, if I have had a cardiac event, if I have had a cerebrovascular accident, probably I should be taking cholesterol lowering medicines for life irrespective of my cholesterol levels. It is not that my cholesterol levels are normal and I stop the medication. If I stop the medication, I run the risk of future cardiovascular events as it would, was there before. So cholesterol lowering medicine has to be taken not based on the cholesterol levels, but on the background cardiovascular risk that we carry. And that determines our treatment rather than the level of cholesterol. Oh, thank you, sir. So can I take uh, statins for a long time, lifelong? Uh, actually, we have our experience with statins is probably as old as me. That is close to 40 years of experience with the, since the discovery of statins. And over the years, lot of concerns have always been raised about the long-term safety of statins. But luckily, I am living in an era where I am seeing patients who have taken statins for 20 years, 25 years, and even some of them have even taken for 30 years. So. Over the such a large period, not major concerns regarding long-term safety has been raised with statins. So, as of now, statins are pretty safe drugs, and at least in my lifetime, I have not come across reports of safety issues with long-term use. Yes, definitely, short-term use, people do develop some symptoms which can be easily managed. But I have never come across statin related long term side effects. I have seen many patients who do not tolerate high dose statins, develop myelgias, develop multiple small issues. 
but it has never been an issue in long term use in fact if i if i remember correctly when the initial statin trials were there there were concerns about neuropsychiatric manifestations whether there are concerns about increased suicidal tendencies there are lot of concerns about long term safety all these concerns have been have turned out to be false and today i can confidently say at least for the next 20 years if i have to take a statin i have enough data to say that it is safe to take long term statin so long term safety of statins is well established and it, we in fact have now even long term safety of high dose statins and that is very interesting because earlier myself also i was skeptical of long term safety with high doses but today i am confident because the data is there to support long term usage of high dose statins also sir uh, suppose uh, i am a diabetic and i am having dyslipidemia what is the significance in fact uh, i would put it in a different way they i would say the very fact that i am diabetic qualifies me as a candidate for statin therapy so if i am diabetic that itself is a sufficient criteria i may not be dyslipidic the very fact that i am diabetic will make me a potential candidate who will benefit from statin therapy so if i am a diabetic i would strongly recommend that diabetics should be on statins on maximum tolerated doses based on their uh, clinical profile and the background risk adding to the dyslipidemic part see diabetics have dyslipidemia just because diabetes is not controlled also so if somebody comes to me with dyslipidemia and diabetes obviously i will treat the dyslipidemia but i will also treat the diabetes more aggressively because if i treat diabetes aggressively is dyslipidemia also gets well managed for example there are many patients who have very high triglycerides and very poorly controlled diabetes the moment i control the diabetes the triglycerides level plummet to within normal levels so maybe the effect on dyslipidemia on diabetes on uh, hdl and ldl may not be so dramatic but definitely with triglycerides there is a dramatic change with better glycemic control so in diabetes i would put it in this way i have a two pronged strategy first i treat the dyslipidemia and number two i treat the diabetes more aggressively to help me manage the dyslipidemia but statins are must in almost all diabetics unless there are any specific contraindications uh thank you sir uh, sir my last question is uh, if i am a diabetic uh, dyslipidemic patient is my diet control sufficient see it's a very tricky question because i will never say diet control is not good and always advocate diet control but the trouble is will diet control achieve the goals and that is where i want to rate rate that diet control may achieve lipid goals or you know cholesterol dyslipidemia targets only in 5 to 10% of the population and that is something everybody should understand see many people have lot of fats they take lot of omega 3 fatty acids lot of things you know people search in the google they take lot of things like people take flax seeds people take so many things expecting that their cholesterol should change with dietary habits but the sad truth is with all this non pharmacological techniques the change in dyslipidemia is to the maximum 10 to 20% so i whenever somebody comes and ask me can i take this uh, you know grape seed extract can i take this flax seed i never discourage them, but i always make it a point to tell them that that may not be sufficient enough there are people who say i took flax seeds for 10 months and my hdl has not improved by even 5% so take them but don't take take them with lot of high expectations so dietary management of dyslipidemia is not sufficient and to tell you very frankly in indian subset the contribution of diet to dyslipidemia is marginal see by definition most indians do not consume non vegetarian food in such high quantities that we can call that that is as if that is contributing to dyslip yes with respect to oil intake many of indians do take lot of oil but still i i am not trying to discourage diet control but i am just trying to emphasize that diet control alone may not be sufficient to control dyslipidemia in most of the population most of the population eventually need some form of lipid lowering agents to manage their dyslipidemia so please and don't misunderstand me i am trying to emphasize that diet control is must is necessary but is not sufficient 
and that's the point I want everybody to take home. Thank you. Thank, uh, thanks for your clarification, uh, Professor. Uh, finally, uh, on behalf of uh, Indian public, I just would like to ask you how you put it in an action on this lecture. What is your take on this? Uh, I would put it in a uh, nutshell that we are a special population. We, we in terms of dyslipidemia, we are the diabetes capital of the world. Eventually, we will be the coronary disease capital of the world, and that is the reason dyslipidemia needs to be targeted as if it is an epidemic and that is the only solution and that is the only way ahead. Everybody should target this lipidemia as, as with the same enthusiasm that we would target any epidemic and that is my sincere humble request that this lipidemia as, a, as an etiology of heart disease has to be targeted exactly the way we would tackle any source of an epidemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Manavar. Thank you.